Right, made a bit more progress on these um, iPod uh, nano displays. I've now got it playing completely standalone. Just running off the batteries just to show there's nothing uh, going into it. Um, this is playing data out of this the 32 megabyte uh, SPI flash chip. It's now obviously on a dedicated bob using um, this flex cable because we're potentially going to have quite a few of these so they're just going to be daisy chained. Um, so we've got the ridiculously big FPGA of which I'm using sort of about 20 pins. Um, RS485 transceiver, serial flash. Um, I haven't got the right surface mount oscillator at the moment so I've had to just bodge this uh, can on for the moment but that'll obviously be in that little footprint there. A power supply, just a butt converter. This is probably going to run on 24 volts eventually. Um, and a backlight boost converter. This flex as well as power, this has got RS-485, this primarily for um, programming data into the flash. It's also handy for just general testing and debug, but it's mostly for uh, programming and also control. So the idea is that this is eventually going to have all the, f all the frame data stored on it, and then just a command down there will tell it what frame, to which tell which um, device, which yeah, which frame to display at any given time, so you can get sort of. Uh, a large amount of content without having to have uh, video bandwidth. It's just it's all a sort of very low bandwidth system. One thing I found that was really handy on the, uh, when I was playing around with this display, um, firstly it supports 16 bits per pixel, although um, the interface that um, that the iPod uses is 24 bits, of which it only actually appears to use 6 bits per pixel, so a total of 18, but this does actually support 16-bit um, per pixel mode which makes life a lot easier because then it's just two bytes per pixel and um, that corresponds to um, slightly uh, <coughs> less than two pages of this flash but the other really handy thing I found was there's um, there's a few commands you have to send the, the display to initialize it and also at the head of, at the beginning of each frame but you don't have to have separate um, packets on the DSi bus you can just get the DSi into high speed mode and just throw packets at it continuously whatever type they are so what you can do is instead of having to have special I mean, in a processor it's not not not, not a bit too much of a big deal to um, have to send some initialization codes well on FPGA or every additional bit of complexity adds logic to the FPGA um, but <clears throat> because you can just send it as one big packet I've actually embedded all the control codes within the actual image data so you've got 480 bytes per line um, two bytes per pixel at uh, 240 pixels and to make life simple if you use one two flash pages which is 512 bytes within those extra 32 bytes you can put all the initialization code so literally all you've got to do is power display up do a simple reset sequence on the actual reset line and then just start throwing it frames out of the um, serial flash that's all it needs to do to display so the first frame that you give it does the display on um, the uh, yeah put, takes it out of sleep mode and turns the display on um, there's also commands you can do things like set the display orientation as well but I mean the fact you can embed all of that into the flash data makes the hardware potentially um, extremely simple so I think you know you could very easily have a serial flash, a very simple CPLD, and get you know 60 frames a second within the capacity of that um, that flash chip, which uh, will work, work quite nicely. Right now that we've got some standalone playback, we're no longer reliant on a fix any fixed frequencies for board rate clocking. We can have a play around running this at different frequencies very easily. Instead of the crystal, I've just connected this up to my um, Agilent RF signal generator, just being used as a pulse generator. And um, there's a simple coupling network, there's a couple of bias resistors and a cap because um, RF SIG gens have bipolar outputs that swing, sort of positive and negative with respect to ground. So there's just a couple of bias resistors to bias it to the centre of the supply range and then a capacitor to couple it in and set the amplitude to give us the 0 to 1.8 volts that we need. And I'll set this to run at a fairly fast frame rate. Um, the, at the moment I'm only using flash in single bit mode. Um, so I can, it's not as fast as it eventually should be, it's, it takes about 35 milliseconds to stop data frame, so there's still a very slight ripple from top, bottom to top, but once I get the multi-bit modes going on the flash, that should get, get um, a lot quicker. Um, but so I just want to really look at how slow this thing can go. So the LVDS clock rate now is 24 megahertz. down at 16 megahertz, still seems quite happy. That's at 8 megahertz, again it seems uh, reasonably happy. That's 4 megahertz and it's still working.
That's at 2 megahertz. Right, it's starting to crap out about 2 megahertz, but I suspect that might actually not be the display. Um, if you look at the actual clock waveform, I think the PLL within the FPGA is having a bit of a hard time staying in sync. I'll just take a look at the clock waveform. Yeah, and that's the clock waveform um, that's coming out of the PLL, so and that's that's all jittery and unstable, so I'm guessing that's actually what the problem is. I mean, the display is still actually working while it's doing that, um, so it looks like it really isn't that fussy, so I think it probably would be pretty viable to drive this thing out of an SPI port. Um, as I'm going to get time, I'll have a play with this, but in the meantime, I've got uh, 20 of these balls to get ready for the end of the week, so um, to focus on that, but I think there's quite a lot of scope for doing stuff with this display. And just for a laugh, let's uh, try cranking it the other way. I've reset this now so this displays a nominally um, one frame a second at its nominal clock rate. Um, this is with the LVDS at 48 megahertz and also the SPI flash running at 48 megahertz. Now technically the SPI flash is only rated up to 50 megahertz in this mode. Um, so let's see what happens. So that's now 60 megahertz. 70. Oh, we're getting an occasional glitch there. Eighty megahertz. It's not entirely happy. We're getting a few odd little glitchy things going on. Ninety. And we're losing quite a lot of data, but we still are actually getting a few sort of decent frames out there. I think the thing that's probably falling over really is the flash rather than the display and this thing's running at 110 meg in the um, iPod so I think it's probably the flash, that's 100 megahertz. So yeah, we're getting quite a nice quick display update but there's something not quite happening right with the uh, reading, we seem to be getting something strange happening there. Well it could be my FPGA code of course that's not doing things quite right at that frequency, it's entirely possible. Yeah, it seems to stop at about 100 megahertz, but um, that is overclocking the flash by a factor of two. But the, there wouldn't be any point in going over 60 frames a second because the um, display's internal refresh is 60 hertz, and that's set by its own internal oscillator. So overclocking it wouldn't actually make that go any faster. So 60 frames a second is probably about the limit. And so using the quad modes of the SPI flash, you, that you should be able to achieve that. Well, obviously you'd run out of memory fairly quickly. Um, the other thing I'm going to look at doing is probably pixel doubling to reduce the amount of flash because this displays such high resolution. The pixel doubling, it probably wouldn't look a great deal worse in practice.